Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's lovely to be here uh, lecturing in the Museum of London uh, with you, with many familiar faces and friends uh, here. Great pleasure for me. Um, everybody, of course, is very familiar with Michelangelo's great Pieta in Rome. Uh, and I'm going to say something about that later, not now. But the purpose of the first part of my talk uh, is to sketch in the background from when the scene of the Pieta first emerged and began to develop and to try to explore why it emerged as an image. So I'm going to say something about that, talk a little bit about the main types of Pieta uh, and then move on to uh, a few examples after Michelangelo, including a few modern uh, examples. Now, the first thing to note is that this, uh, the scene of the Pieta uh, is not actually described in the New Testament. Um, what we have in the New Testament, of course, is the crucifixion, uh, the deposition or taking down from the cross, uh, the laying on the coal stone, or as it's known in orthodoxy, this is an orthodox example used on Good Friday, the epitaphios, uh, the lamentation, and the entombment. Those are the scenes described uh, in the New Testament. The Pieta is not described. So I suppose the first interesting question is how and why uh, did it emerge? And I think we need to bear in mind at least two, if not three, uh, factors uh, which lie behind the emergence of the 12th century uh, in Germany towards the end of the 13th century, in particular that part of Germany known as Thuringia. Um, so the first background, bit of background to bear in mind is a distinction between a narrative image and a devotional image. On the screen now is a narrative image because it is part of a scene from the Gospels with a number of different figures in it. And that differs from a devotional image like uh, this uh, one, whereby the image is actually taken out uh, of its narrative context uh, and used simply for devotional uh, purposes. And these devotional images began to emerge again towards the end of the 13th century from uh, Germany. And they were associated with a very, very intense form of uh, piety which began with the Franciscans in the 13th century, where the viewer was encouraged to be before the image, to imagine Christ's suffering in particular, uh, and to think of themselves and their salvation in relation to that suffering of Christ. Uh, so, for example, a Franciscan prayer book has this prayer uh, before uh, this Byzantine image of the man of sorrows. Oh, how intensely thou embraced me, good Jesus, when the blood went forth from thy heart, the water from thy side, the soul from thy body. Most sweet youth, what hast thou done that thou shouldest suffer so? Surely I too am the cause of thy sorrow. And although this is a Byzantine image of the man of sorrows, it came to the West in the form of a print uh, by Israel van uh, Meckenhem, uh, which was very, very widely used for this very intense form of personal devotion. And this particular scene has been described as the most characteristic scene uh, of medieval uh, devotion. So there were a number of these devotional uh, images uh, emerging uh, at that time, at the end of the 13th century from Germany, of which the Pieta uh, was one. And the second bit of background to bear uh, in mind uh, is the uh, emergence of a very high doctrine of the Virgin Mary. 
some of these I'm flicking through very quickly, but I'll be lingering on some of the ones of the Pieta as we move on to them. But just to remind you that during the Middle Ages, uh, we get uh, the doctrine uh, of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the great scene of the coronation of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Mater Dolorosa, the Mother of Christ sharing uh, in his sufferings, about which I'm going to say a little bit more, uh, and uh, the uh, lamentation. But this is actually uh, the uh, orthodox uh, view uh, of, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, lamentation. Um, and uh, called, the, called the, the, the threnos. Now this emphasis upon, A, upon Mary, the importance of Mary in Christian devotion, and in particular Mary sharing in the suffering of Jesus, goes back really to quite early ages. For instance, there's a meditation of Romanus, a poem of his called Lament of the Mother of God, dating from the 6th century, which says... I am conquered, my child, I am conquered by love. And truly I cannot bear that I should be in my room, but you on the tree, that I should be in my house and you in a grave. Let me come with you, for to see you heals me, my son uh, and my God. And this idea of uh, Mary sharing in the suffering of uh, Christ uh, was particularly reinforced uh, by a number of uh, women miskits at, uh, at the time for whom it was very important such as St. Mechtahild of, of Hackborn. So that threnos uh, was part of, uh, of the background. Now another image which was part of the background which helps to make sense of the emergence of the, of the Pieta, what is called uh, the Virgin of Humility. And you can see how this Virgin of Humility where she is sitting and where she's looking down uh, at Jesus, again can come together in a creative way with some of the images of Mary's suffering uh, that I was uh, talking about uh, before. Now, scholars have identified three main types of the uh, Pieta. First of all, the early German type. Uh, and this is an example of the, this is the Röttgen Pieta of 1325. I'm going to leave these Pietas up for you to look at them. I'm not going to rush through them from this, this side part. And what distinguishes these early German ones is that the torso is virtually upright and the arms, shoulders, and head of Christ are on a sharply diagonal axis. And the upright torso is a very natural development of the, of the deposition. We notice that here Christ is smaller than his mother, a child in her arms again. And this, of course, was one of the reasons why the image of Pieta, when it first began to emerge, was so startling to people. People were used to Mary being shown with the baby Jesus in her arms, but now that baby is dead. And we notice the anguish in the face of Mary, and it's good to remember that the 14th century was the century of the Black Death, when a fifth of the population of Europe were wiped out. So that is the uh, first example of, of the, the early German uh, type. This is the second type, when the body forms a continuous curve and the shape is a natural continuation of the descent from the cross. This is the, not known as the Villeneuve d'Avignon, the late 15th century, it's in the, in the Louvre. There's restraint in Mary's grief there. The simplicity of sorrow, as Lawrence Gowing, the art critic, described it. And the Virgin is in prayer, which we get sometimes, not clutching the body. 
And there's a clerical donor in the picture you can see as you look on the bottom left-hand side. And in the background is Constantinople. And we remember that in 1453, Constantinople was destroyed. So this is a lament for the fall of Constantinople as well as a lament for the dead Jesus. So that is the second type that has been identified when the body forms a continuous curve. And then the third type is when uh, the body uh, is... uh, Sorry, that is is the Villeneuve uh, one, just to have a closer uh, look at, uh, at that. Because I didn't forgot, I forgot to say that's John at at the end, uh, gently removing uh, the halo. So the third type is when the body is horizontal, with the arms and legs of Jesus extending beyond the lap. This is by uh, Perugino. A bit later, the end of the 15th century, uh, in the, now in the Uffizi. And it's typical of its time in that it's got a portico and some serene landscape in the background. Other figures are present, including the youthful Nicodemus and an aged Joseph of Arimathea. And we can see, looking at this, how this leads naturally into further stages of the narrative with the body being lifted down to lie horizontally on the ground, on the altar of anointing, and then on to the lamentation and the entombment. So three main types then. The early German, uh, where the torso is virtually upright, uh, and the body of Christ is a sharp diagonal axis across that. The second type, when the body forms a continuous curve and the shape is a natural continuation of the descent from the cross. And the third one, this one by Perugino, where uh, the body is horizontal with the arms and the legs of Jesus extending beyond them. I think we have a close-up of this now. So though the wound is present on this Perugino one, There's not a huge emphasis on it. When we look again at some of the early German ones, there's much more emphasis upon the suffering of Jesus. So here is uh, uh, another uh, example. Now, scholars point out that, in fact, there's no clear line of development from the early German to the second type to the third type. They tend to merge gently one into another. And I'm showing a number of different examples. Sometimes they're more of one type, more uh, than than, uh, another. But there's no clear line of development that has yet been traced. So this is the uh, Pieta of Tarascon. Uh, It's a Provençal, middle of the... 15th uh, century and it's in the Cluny uh, Museum and at this point it's worth pointing out that although the image of the Pieta developed towards the end of the 13th century uh, in Thuringia in in Germany uh, within a hundred years it had spread to France and then all over France and was hugely popular uh, in France and eventually really through French influence uh, came uh, to Uh, Italy. Now this uh, is a very well-known example of a pieta called uh, the Lorsch pieta. This is quite small in size and another historical point worth bearing in mind Uh, is that between 1300 and 1500, works of art ceased to be purely public works for people to see uh, in churches or or on the walls of sacred buildings, Uh, but it became art that came into the house 
for personal devotion. So you get portable paintings and portable icons. And it is just possible that this was small enough actually to be taken into a house and used for personal devotion and wouldn't just have been necessarily uh, in a, uh, a, a chapel. Um, a number of things we can note uh, about, about this. Um, first of all, of course, the intense sorrow on Mary's face, looking down at her son. The wound very marked. And at the bottom, uh, a sign of the rosary, because during this time also uh, the devotion of the rosary began to emerge. And this uh, is a uh, one uh, indication of that. So this, as you can imagine, gave rise to a very intense form of devotion. So that, for instance, uh, Heinrich Suso, who lived in the 13th, end of 13th, 14th century, who played a key role uh, in the development of private devotion, uh, has Mary showing the viewer and talking to the viewer, expressing how much sorrow she feels. And then... Suso addresses Mary uh, with uh, the words, Alas, pure tender lady, I now beg you to offer me your tender child as it appeared when dead, placing it on the lap of my soul so that according to my ability I may be vouchsafed in a spiritual manner and in meditation that which befell you in a physical uh, manner. So there is a desire for total spiritual identification. The past has become present uh, and the physical has become uh, spiritual. And now we have another example, a Pieta from Mainz, dating from 1390. We can see here, this is a, another example of the early German sort with the torso upright and the body diagonal. But there are a number of different features about this. First of all, uh, Mary uh, is sitting uh, on Golgotha rather than a throne, uh, so that if you look down here, you can see the skulls, skulls uh, of Gol Golgotha. According to Jewish legend at the time, the skull of Adam uh, was buried in Golgotha, and that obviously is taken up uh, in this image. There's the skulls there. But as you can see, a great emphasis in these early German ones of the suffering of Jesus. You can see that huge wound in his side with the blood pouring down and the face, one of deep sorrow. And here's another example. This is called the uh, Krivakova Pieta from uh, Kesky. Uh, towards the end of the 14th century. The body stiff across Mary's lap, polychrome. And another example, the Sion Pieta, by an unknown artist, which is now in a m museum in Munich, very similar to the Krivak of a one. And this became one of the most popular kind of cult images, with the loving gaze of Mary 
and the body held up but the head falling back lifeless. And another one from the German Valley of the Rhine, uh, dating from, again, the end of the 14th century, made a poplar polychrome with gilding. It's in the Cloisters uh, Museum in New York. What's different about this is that it, this is very much an enthroned virgin, and the frontality is striking, carved in very high relief, suitable for an intimate setting of a side altar and designed to have a profound empathetic effect on those who said their prayers uh, before it. And both this and the subsequent image are hollowed out at the back. And of course, as you can see, there's a great emphasis here again upon uh, the suffering, the emaciated, emaciated Christ's body. And we note again the small size of the dead Christs, reflecting the meditation of the mystics of the morning Mary, again taking her child on her lap. Have we got a close-up of this or not? No, we haven't. Let's go. But we can, we can see the emaciated lip in that pass. And another one from the uh, uh, cloisters, uh, again Germany, Swabia, a little bit later. And then we have something very different from the 17th century. This is a Tyrolean one with a great sword going through uh, Mary's heart. Uh, and it was uh, in this medieval uh, period from the 15th century on onwards, as part of the growth in devotion to Mary, uh, that you got the feast uh, of commemorating the anguish and sorrow of Mary uh, and the development of the devotion known uh, as the Seven Sorrows of Mary. The seven sorrows being the prophecy of Simeon, that a sword would go through her own heart, which is depicted there, the flight to Egypt, the loss of the boy Jesus in the temple, meeting Jesus on the way to the cross, Jesus crucified and taken down from the cross, the Pieta and the entombment. So that's uh, Tyrolean with one of the seven sorrows of Mary. This is uh, an early 15th century alabaster pieta uh, from England. Eng the middle, um, middle England um, was uh, a great producer of alabaster religious images uh, in the Middle Ages. And there are a good number uh, in the British Museum and also in, in the V&A, which you may very well uh, have, have seen. Um, interestingly, so also uh, was uh, the Netherlands a product. Uh, you produce these alabaster images of the, of the Pieta, but the ones in England were on the whole designed for the bottom end of the market and the ones which were emanating from the Netherlands more for the, the top end uh, of, of the master. About, this is about a metre high. It's actually in Cluny, uh, about 20 from England survived from before the generation, but probably almost every church would have had one. And Mar the mystic Marjorie Kemp describes being moved to tears by uh, an image somewhat like this. We notice the very small body uh, displaying uh, the wounds, reassuring the viewer about their redemption. And Mary is looking quite serene, looking to the resurrection. What we have here is uh, Mary touching her veil. Um, do we see that? Yes, Mary touching her veil. 
which is a characteristic feature of English depictions of the Pieta. She wrapped the Christ child in this veil and hides his, the nakedness of his uh, dead body. There are traces of the original blue on this, actually, which you can just see around her, her, her head. And this was the time uh, when actually images like this were beginning to become rather controversial with some people, particularly the Lollards. And there's evidence of a no no Norfolk farmer uh, refusing to pray before images like this on grounds that it was not uh, biblical and, ref and refusing to do penance uh, in this way. So as I said, this image, very small Jesus, this image, uh, alabaster, uh, English, from the early 15th century. It was designed for the lower end of the market, but if you go over to the Netherlands, you again you get something alabaster from about 1430, um, fine-grained gypsum, soft, easy to work, lent itself to delicate details, so that we have the beard and the pleats in Mary's head covering, and a slightly elongated Mary, Mary uh, viewed from uh, below. And in terms of, sort of the development of a more, what we might call more classical style, this is obviously showing some development uh, towards, towards that. It's very finely carved beard. And fine face and headgear. And then another example from Swabia about uh, 1500. Um, Jesus dra here draped one of the ones that Jesus draped across Mary in a less stylized kind of way. And so we begin to come on to Michelangelo, which we've sa I've said before. Um, here, I'll say a little bit more in a few seconds, but here we obviously we notice uh, the classical pose. Many of the harsher features uh, have been ironed out. No emphasis upon the suffering as such. A youthful face of Mary. In fact, Michelangelo did a number of versions of this scene. Uh, there uh, is the uh, Rondonini Pieta from 1564, about which I'm not actually going to say anything now. But there is this Florentine Pieta, his Pieta uh, in uh, uh, Florence. So have a look at that first of all before I say anything about that. I suppose, first of all, we notice that uh, it has overtones uh, both of the deposition of the descent from the cross uh, as well as the lamentation. It's kind of it's a moving down from the deposition to the pieta to the lamentation. And what is most remarkable about it, of course, uh, is the figure of Nicodemus. Tradition says that Nicodemus was a sculptor and indeed, there's a very famous picture of Jesus on the cross as a high priest at Lucca in northern Italy, the Volto Sancto, uh, which tradition says was actually carved uh, by Nicodemus. What's interesting about this is uh, that Michelangelo carved it uh, in 1547 uh, at a time of great personal distress following the death of his friend Vittoria Colonna. But in 1555, he tried to destroy it. Why should he try to destroy such a fine uh, statue? Well, there's a very interesting uh, article uh, by the registrar of Gresham, uh, Valerie Shrimplin, uh, and there's a reference to it in the notes. You can look at it if you want to, uh, where uh, she argues that, in fact, 
Michelangelo was a member of an early reforming group in the church, sympathetic to certain ideas which later tended to be labelled Protestant ideas, an emphasis on faith, not works, but of course at that time it was reform going on within the church and they wouldn't have been labelled uh, in that way. But this group of reformers were called Spirituali and they were also called Nicomedans. And in the 1530s, they had sympathisers in papal circles and, and indeed in the early uh, 40s, just before uh, Michelangelo uh, carved this in 1540-47. And she suggests that it was a bold statement of Michelangelo's position and done for his to own personal tomb at this time, uh, particularly elicited by his distress at the death of his friend Vittoria, but later on, new people committed to the counter-reformation counter ideas came into power. And the statement of such a bold identification of Nicodemus as himself on a statue like that for his own tomb was clearly very dangerous. Uh, and therefore, uh, he was worried about that, but he was also very worried about the split in the church which had taken place by that time. And although he'd originally intended to be buried in Rome, in fact, uh, because of all this, he was eventually buried in, uh, in Florence. But those of you who've seen it will know that it is a very powerful work indeed. Um, and in particular, that face of Nicodemus, oblique stroke Michelangelo, is particularly powerful. Then we have the famous Roman uh, Pieta. Michelangelo sculpted this work from 1498 uh, to 1500. It was a time when Rome was full of wealthy households. Cardinals with large retinues were anxious to display their standing by commissioning works of art, and artists came to Rome from all over to enhance their reputation. Michelangelo was only 24 when he was asked to uh, produce uh, this and it was done for the funeral chapel of St Petronilla in St Peter's for the French ambassador Cardinal Bill Jerez de Langralas um, and uh, there are a number of very notable features uh, about it uh, first of all uh, the face of Mary is very youthful. Why was Mary depicted, in fact, as just a very young girl? Then we notice uh, that Mary is not actually holding the body of Jesus, but there's a cloth between her and the body. The wound is very uh, tiny. Michelangelo expla explained that uh, Mary was depicted as a young woman because of the purity, her purity. And another suggestion that he's reflecting a line in Dante's great poem about which he was passionate, in which Mary is prayed to in those lovely words taken up by T.S. Eliot, Filia del tuo Filio, daughter of your son. But I think the most interesting suggestions I've come across in an article, uh, which again there's a reference to it uh, in the notes, uh, is that this has to be seen not first of all as a work of art, but as a liturgical object and a liturgical object that visually realises a Renaissance theology uh, of, of Mary. First of all, as I said, it was going to be in the funeral chapel, the mortal chapel, where masses would be said for the dead person who had commissioned the chapel, in this case, uh, the French ambassador, the, the, the cardinal. Uh, 
And this would have been over the altar. Uh, and it's been suggested uh, that uh, when the host was lifted up, it would appear against this very, very white background uh, of the marble. Uh, and that this cloth here was like the, the humus which went around and over the uh, consecrated host. And that, in fact, what Mary is doing is offering her son on the altar uh, in tandem with uh, the offering uh, of the Eucharist host in the, in the Mass. And the fact that she is so youthful uh, is an indication uh, of her, her, her uh, immaculate conception, a doctrine which had been uh, established definitively uh, or, or definitively for the time. It wasn't, in fact, definitively established for the Catholic Church of the 19th century, but it had become very, very powerful uh, when Michelangelo was a boy. Uh, he was a third order Franciscan, that is, a lay person who took certain Franciscan vows. And the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception was very, very uh, important for the uh, Franciscans. Um, uh, and Mary, of course, is also a symbol of the church described uh, in the Bible as without spot or, or, or wrinkle. So I think it's right to see this as a liturgical object, ascent, uh, integrally related to the celebration of the Mass where Mary is offering her son in the same way that the priest is offering the host on the altar that visually realises a Renaissance theology of Mary in particular the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. So I'm just going to show a few uh, more uh, fairly quickly before we come to look at some more uh, modern ones. Um, there's the Bellini Pieta. dating from 1505, the Academia in Venice. The cities in the background are Vicenza and Ravenna. What's notable about this is that Mary's face is very aged and worn with suffering. Very strong contrast uh, to Michelangelo's depiction. And although Mary is in what's called a hortus conclusus, a, a sort of sacred garden there with a hedge, in fact, it is not a garden, a spring where everything is growing up, uh, but it is a garden of dead stumps and, and twigs. Indicating the sadness of the scene. And then we have uh, Titian's Pieta, dating from 1575 in the Academia in Venice. And this, as been suggested, contains a Nicodemus, which is a self-portrait of Titian looking into the face of Christ, Titian looking into the face of Christ as he, as he himself faces the prospect of death and also in, this, also in the picture is a, his son uh, Orazio at the, foot of the, uh, at the foot of the column. Venice at the time was in the grip of the plague uh, and this was an ex voto offering that he and his son might be spared the plague. Uh, they were not spared and it was left unfinished and it was offered to the church of the Frari in return for a resting place with the deal unmade. And there's a menacing grey graze in the painting indicating the sorrow and sadness not only of the death of Jesus but also Venice in the grip of plague and Titian himself ill and old, but it's not all grey. There are tints of light 
uh, around as, as well. And then we have this Anibal Karachi from 1600, which was a scene which began to develop. The difference, of course, is that Christ's head, uh, he, he, the, Christ is on the ground with the head on Mary's lap. And then a very, very big jump to Van Gogh, his Pieta after Delacroix. You may have seen this recently because, in fact, it is in the exhibition at the Royal Academy, Rubens and his influence. Rubens painted a great picture, Christ on Straw, uh, and the exhibition shows uh, that the posture of Christ the dead body of Christ on the floor, was eventually echoed by Delacroix, uh, and Delacroix in turn uh, was echoed by Van Gogh, which is why they showed this in the exhibition of Rembrandt, uh, Rubens and his influence. It is, of course, rather uncharacteristically, uh, uncharacteristic of Van Gogh, but of course... Uh, artists down the ages, as that exhibition made clear, they, because Rubens was such a superb artist and draftsman, uh, as part of people's continuing in pre, in training and self-improvement, they tended to copy uh, Rubens, which Delacroix did in part and Van Gogh did in part. So let's look at one or two more uh, modern ones now, just for the last five minutes. Uh, before we open up for uh, some questions and discussion. This uh, is by a lady called Sybil Andrews, um, who worked uh, in the earlier part of the uh, 20th century. You can see her dates are 1898 to 1992. And she worked in lino cuts, um, she is becoming a little bit better known now, and there have been one or two exhibitions of her work recently, and I found this and some of her other works very striking indeed. They're clearly modernist in style, uh, but they also have a great devotional feel to them. Then some of you may very well have seen this in Winchester Cathedral by Peter Ball. Peter Ball has a number of works in British churches and cathedrals, particularly Winchester. This is his Pieta from Winchester. And clearly he draws on ro various Romanesque and Celtic motifs. But his work is very evocative, powerful. Born in 1943. This one you probably have not seen. It's by Fenwick Lawson in Durham Cathedral. Yes, you might have done. But um, I first saw this about 30 years ago when it was on exhibition in York and it made an immediate impression on me. Fenwick Lawson's work appears mainly in churches in the north of England. There's nothing very much in the south so far as I know. What is different, of course, about this scene is that the body of Christ is actually on the ground, not on the lap. Mary's looking down. Now, the next one I'm going to show has rather an unusual story. Um, an artist uh, called uh, Balthazar Schmidt in 1904 made a sculpture in this early Romanesque style for St. Paul's Munich with the Madonna 
facing the front, offering sun for redemption of the world. It was badly damaged by fire in, and in other ways. Um, and this is actually a copy of the work, a faithful copy. But a contemporary German artist called Stefan Knorr, K-N-O-R, seeing the original damaged and abandoned work, it was just tucked away in a storehouse somewhere in 2009, was so impressed with its uh, charisma that he decided to turn it into a modern version. And this is the modern version uh, of the damaged and originally damaged and abandoned work. And this was shown in Canterbury Cathedral last year. And it made a powerful impression. The combination of the charred wood and the gold outline and highlights, highlights were very effective in creating that combination of pathos and suffering and love and glory. And then we have some strange, interesting examples of modern, other modern takes, less devotional, let, let, but uh, uh, idiosyncratic. We have Sam Jinks, an Australian artist. He takes the form of Michelangelo's Pieta and gives it a modern secular twist. We have this by Sam Taylor Wood. I think she's got married and added another name to her, her name now as well. And that's was under her original name. One by Max Ernst. David La Chapelle, so the modern imagination has gone off in all kinds of ways. Not surprisingly, given the power of the image, both in terms of its form and its idea. It's by Max Ginsberg, a New York artist born in 1931. It's won a prize in 2007. And the last one I'm going to show, a slightly more traditional uh, one, Chris Gollan, born in 1963, I think it was. Um, his work was shown in Guildford Cathedral last year. He had an exhibition. It's interesting, I think, about this. Mary is actually looking away from the body of Christ and she's in contemplation or praying for the world. Certainly a different stance. The shadows on the body of Jesus indicate the darkness and, and death and the sadness. That's Chris Gollum, G-O-L-L-O-N. So, ladies and gentlemen, you can see that this image, which developed in Germany at the end of the 13th century, as one of a number of devotional 
uh, images emerging at that time with an emphasis upon very, very intense personal piety, particularly uh, at home before, uh, before an image. And against the background of the developing role and importance of the Virgin Mary, particularly the idea of Mary herself sharing uh, in the suffering of Christ, those pietas developed in different kind of styles, reaching a kind of classical peak, if one likes that classical style of Michelangelo, but it has been a very, very uh, evocative uh, image uh, ever since there in almost every period, not least in our own time. So we now have a bit of time, I'm glad to say, for your views or any questions you might have. Thank you very much.